On to today's event. We're very pleased to welcome Kevin Delaney, Editor-in-Chief and uh, co-founder of Quartz. In an age when traditional media are finding hard to stay relevant and to stay in the black, Quartz, it's going its own way in online news. Its look is different, uh, its content is different, and uh, in his letter to readers at launch two years ago, Kevin had this to say. Quartz is intended to embody the era in which we're creating it, like Wired in the 90s, Rolling Stone in the 60s, Fortune in the 1930s, and The Economist in the 1840s. What is the best way to build a global news organization in 2012? With your help, we'll figure it out. So, I guess the question is, two years on, have they figured it out yet? We're here, we're here first from Kevin, and then allow time for some Q&A before wrapping up around 2 p.m. So, over to Kevin. Thank you. Thank you all. Uh, thank you all for having us here today. Um, it's an honor to be here, and uh, and I, I'll looking forward to spending uh, to getting through what I some some thoughts about quartz and the industry over the next twenty minutes, and then hearing what you all have to say about it. One of the questions I have for you is why did you laugh when he mentioned the Economist being created in the eighteen forties? So uh, so quartz, you know, part of the uh, part of the what we're talking about here today is um, is creating a thriving digital newsroom, and we might as well start with with one piece of evidence that that we are actually thriving and have something to say on this topic. So behind me, you can see the readership of Quartz. In uh, we launched a little bit over two years ago, including with a, a launch party here in Hong Kong, and uh, and now as of the latest month that we've published our uh, readership figures. Uh, we had 10.9 million readers around the world. About half of our readers are in the U.S. Half of them are outside of the U.S. Uh, we're a global business publication, and we actually are pretty inspired by The Economist. So the, the founding uh, thought experiment of Quartz, in a way, was if The Economist magazine was created now and not in 1843, what would it be? And I say that out of great respect for The Economist, which is an incredible media brand, that has, that has lasted all these decades. So the answer to that, that question for us was uh, that it would, we should be digitally native, mobile and tablet first, because all of the, the growth and readership of news is uh, taking place on those devices. We should be global, so we should actually take a view of the, the new global economy. Uh, today, Quartz has uh, about 35 journalists, about a third of them outside of the US. Um, our staff speaks 19 different languages and has reported from 115 different countries. You all are, um, are, are the sort of post-national uh, readers and professionals that, uh, that we're looking to serve with Quartz. The last thing that Quartz we wanted to be uh, was journalistic. And uh, it's very easy to pursue results like this and readerships like this, uh, or it's easier if you um, if you abandon some of the, the values of journalism. But in fact, we believe that there is an opportunity and something of a golden age of journalism to do something that's digitally native, but actually profoundly journalistic at the same time. And our, our staff, which I'll talk about briefly, reflects that. So I want to, I'll walk through a little bit how Quartz operates and how we think about some of the questions facing media. I want to start first with readers. Um, and if you can see this, this is a, a survey that's done in the U.S. Uh, every year where they ask readers, uh, when during the day do you get your news? And effectively the question is, uh, do, you read, do you get your news from things like newspapers, the evening news, do you go to CNN.com during your lunchtime, or does news come to you in your life? So do you get news from uh, headlines that your friends send you by email, or things that you see in your Twitter stream, uh, news that you consume on your mobile phone throughout your day as opposed to at specific periods when you're sitting down with the newspaper. The trend in the US, and from what we can tell is globally, is that readers are actually getting their news throughout the day. And this requires a different kind of distribution. So we're looking specifically at a business readership. And, um, and this is probably too hard to see. If you want, um, we can distribute this also. The URL for this is at the bottom, insights.qz.com slash GES. And, um, and I can share that. Uh, but what we did is we surveyed 1,000 top business people around the world. And we asked them about 
uh, when they, where they got their news from and when they actually read their news. And what's interesting is that uh, these executives who we surveyed spend, a third of them spend over an hour on news a day. I'm gonna go through this quickly because I think you probably can't see it that well. And it turns out that mobile and tablet are devices uh, that are used uh, to get the news. So it's not just teenagers and the sort of younger uh, millennial generation, but it actually, it re this trend reaches to business executives now. 61% of the people that we surveyed primarily use a mobile device to consume news at this point. Um, and we also asked about the first three news sources they checked during a day. So email newsletters, uh, mobile web, news apps are among the top uh, things that they do. Um, one interesting pattern, which might be interesting to all of you, is that business readers actually read news in the morning. So the, a huge percentage of their consumption takes place before they, uh, they go to work. Um, and uh, Quartz has, uh, one of the ways in which we're approaching that is what we call the daily brief, which is a morning email briefing for business readers. So going back to Quartz, so we've, we've looked at the readership. So the readership is getting their news on mobile devices and it's coming to them throughout the day. Um, so the opportunity as we created Quartz was to focus on this. So what we did is we designed Quartz for mobile and tablet devices first, and then after that, designed the desktop. So it, that's the opposite of the traditional way that new sites are designed. You have a desktop, and then you retrofit it um, to, the, to the mobile devices. So this is the way that we think about people consuming Quartz. You can go to qz.com on pretty much any device and you should have a really good experience. That's what our technical development is focused on. The other thing that's, that's relevant uh, to this discussion is how, how people spend their time online. And if you can see this chart, this is US users, but again, has some application globally. Um, and what you can see, the, the fat blue bar at the bottom is Facebook. Uh, people spend a lot of time on Facebook and you know, as many of you know, that's effectively the, uh, the engine of growth in consumption for news right now. What's really interesting, you know, going back to this question about business readers, what's really interesting is that if you write content that's, if you produce content that's relevant to a certain group of readers, it will find them via the social distribution channels. So Quartz, um, which, which doesn't, which is focused on uh, creating content that is compelling for business readers um, has reached via primarily through social distribution channels has reached a very um, serious business readership. So about our, the median age of our uh, reader is 43 years old. We over index in uh, industries of finance, uh, consulting, media, technology. We over our readers over index on travel uh, and in on uh, luxury spending, I guess. Um, close to 70% of our readers globally are classified as executives. And in some markets, uh, such as the UK, close to 90% of our readers are classified as executives. So I think one takeaway from our experience the last two years is that is a conviction that, uh, that the, the patterns of people finding content, consuming content on their mobile devices via social networks actually reaches into demographics uh, including business users that you, where you might not have thought it would be as deep as possible, as deep as that. About, as I mentioned earlier, about half of our readers are outside of the US. So as best as we can tell, it is a trend that's supported globally. I showed you uh, Quartz on a phone. This is another experience we think about a lot, which is Quartz's presentation on Facebook. And as I said, this is, the, this is a way that a lot of our readers are finding our content. So I'd like to spend a few minutes and talk about the content that we produce and how we, um, and how we, our journalists go about producing in a way that's successful with these readers and through this distribution. One way we, we talk about it is what's known as the, what we've coined as the quartz curve. Um, and basically, I'll show you a few examples of this to make it clear. Basically on the y-axis you have the likelihood of success. And so this is uh, the number of readers, your journalistic impact, um, the probability that you'll actually succeed in some fundamental way. And then on the x-axis, there are a bunch of different factors that you can put. So, um, so one of them is word count. Uh, 
And it turns out that if you look at, let's get us here. Okay. Um, nope. Well, I'll just tell you. So if you look at uh, what people read online, if you look at the data about the content that people read online, and Quartz is connected to the Atlantic magazine. We have the same owner. So we're, we see their, their uh, traffic data as well. It turns out that people read things that are short and focused and in the news uh, and, and you know, generally creative and very shareable. And they read things at the other end of the curve, things that are uh, more ambitious and where there's a payoff for them in terms of narrative, analysis, uh, reporting. So I, there are two examples here. Um, one of them is uh, a chart on the left side of the curve, which is something an example of something that's very fast. Um, it's something about Apple's market cap that one of our reporter, reporters charted. It's very shareable. It was very fast. It was on uh, some Apple news. And on the right-hand side is, a, is an example of an essay that one of our reporters wrote, uh, which was about 5,000 words long. And it was an economic argument for paternity leave, which probably had about 20 different charts in it. It was a very serious argument. Uh, and the thesis was essentially that uh, a key to achieving equality for women in the workplace is to, uh, to treat men uh, similar to women in terms of their benefits. This was written by a female uh, writer. So what we see is that our most popular content is actually on the ends of this curve. Uh, what's not our most popular content is, um, here's another example. Um, this is when Steve Ballmer announced that he was resigning from Microsoft. He just made, in the news, a uh, reporter wrote, he just made $625 million by firing himself, uh, which was a very simple calculation, but was ultimately something that people were sharing in the moment of the news. That post was just a few hundred words long. And then the same reporter spent a few days and, uh, and interviewed a bunch of uh, Microsoft insiders about what was going on at the company and wrote a post that was a few thousand words long. That was also extremely popular. So the point is that, um, is that news organizations need to think about the short, the fast, the shareable, and the long. And there's a, there's a readership for both of these things. The challenge is you, you, know, you might react when you see this is that traditional news organizations their standard unit of production is in the middle of the curve, in the area that's least likely to uh, find success with readers. The 700-word article um, that, it, that might not be shareable because it's a little bit all over the place and unfocused. I myself am guilty of writing hundreds of those uh, as a journalist. So, so don't take it personally if, um, if that's what your organizations are doing. Um, and part of, the, part of what happens when you step away from a traditional news organization is that you can get away from the practices that are connected to the manufacturing of newspapers and publications over 100 years ago. So one of them is word count. Obviously, a 700 word article is a vestige of newspapers where you had to lay them out and it was much easier to lay them out if you had articles of a certain length. Um, another thing is writing, uh, writing your headlines. So in newspaper manufacturing, the headline was already always written uh, the last. And it was actually written generally by someone in the manufacturing part of the process. And that's because, like these guys here who are fiddling with the type, they were the only people who actually knew how much space there was in the manufacturing part of the process and the printing plate. So one of the ways in which Quartz is different is that we tell our reporters, write your headline first. Uh, when a reporter says they want to write an article about them, we, we say, write your headline first, and your headline should be your tweet. Um, and the reason we do that is it's a way to focus the journalist on what is most interesting about what I'm writing. And it's actually a pretty powerful mechanism uh, for a conversation between a reporter and an editor about what is interesting and the reason that we're writing something. And it's focusing in the mind of the reporters for, why am I writing this? And what are the things that I can leave out? Because they're not fundamentally connected to what's really interesting about this issue. Um, another thing to think about is uh, digital journalism today is about writing for people. The majority of Quartz's readers actually come in through social media. And we've only uh, succeeded if people actually share uh, the content. They think it's so good they want to share it with their friends. One of the criticisms of uh, organizations that do well in social media is that they engage in clickbait. So they have headlines that trick someone. That actually was possible 
you know, 10 years ago when Google's robots were, um, were analyzing the web and people were gaming the headlines to actually appear in more prominently in search results. Today, you've only succeeded if you, the content itself is actually good and people, after reading it, go on to share it. Another way that we think about um, the content that we produce is that it's at the intersection of the important and the interesting. And so we want to write about things that are important, but we want to really make an effort to make the presentation of them interesting. Um, and there's some things that arguably are less important that we'll write about, but we will write about because they're interesting to our readers. And I think uh, we all, in terms of our readerships, should have, a, should have the expectation that our readers want us to produce things that are interesting, you know, given a choice of interesting or not. So that gets us to um, how we actually produce it. So I want to spend one, one minute on uh, the training and the practice of the Quartz journalists. Um, this is one of our senior editors. Sort of framed it, I think, pretty well. The challenge of understanding what people want to share. It's not clear to us that this can actually be taught, but it definitely can be learned. And part of the way uh, to do that is by practicing. Um, Quartz's belief is that having people uh, who know what they're talking about is a, is a good starting point for having content that's interesting and what people want to share. This is a, a, a cross-section of our staff, um, including Adam Pasek, who's a Reuters veteran and is, is with us here from Bangkok uh, today. Um, you know, we have a handful of folks from the Wall Street Journal, The Economist, Reuters, Financial Times, Bloomberg. Um, and so the, the sort of starting point is good journalists who are motivated uh, to work, who are motivated by the journalistic opportunities of writing interesting things for the social and mobile web. So it's not just uh, millennials and, uh, and so forth. Um, one of the ways that we, um, that we accelerate the work that we do is by giving the tools uh, to the journalists themselves. So this is a, these are uh, charts that were created by, our, by the journalists, not by a separate graphics department. And Quartz invested the staff resources to create something which we called Chart Builder. And what it is is a tool to make very simple charts. So probably half of our posts or more actually have charts in them created by uh, journalists like Adam and I who are not specialists in data visualization. Um, but our belief is that the web is a very visual uh, storytelling medium. And for business readers, charts are a really efficient way for them to absorb information. We want every journalist to be able to do that. So it's called Chart Builder. And we've actually open sourced it. And it's now used by a lot of news organizations. If you uh, search for Chart Builder in GitHub, you can actually use it. Uh, use it yourself. It's being used by the Wall Street Journal and Nikkei and uh, NPR and CNBC. Um, another thing that being very digital allows us to do is to really depart from the form. This is common for some traditional news organizations that um, that invested in development capabilities. This is this is worth um, spending a little bit of time with. I put the URL at the bottom of the slide. Uh, we took the database of every active satellite orbiting the Earth and, and animated it and made it accessible, including on your mobile phone. You can actually go on your phone and see this database and see uh, where all the satellites are and play with it. This, I think, is an example of one of the uh, journalistic opportunities that are accessible uh, when you're operating digitally, natively, and, uh, and playing with the form of, of what you produce. Um, here's another example. Um, which is uh, several of our reporters went through some government filings in Luxembourg that came out as uh, part of a court case. Uh, and they compiled a sort of tongue-in-cheek tax avoidance power ranking, which was basically all of these uh, multinationals have created these very complicated corporate structures. So they went through and, um, and, and rated them kind of as you would rate uh, wine or a television show or something something like that. So I know we want to have time for, uh, for questions, and uh, I'm going to stop there. Um, perhaps immodestly, um, I'm going to end with a different view of the first slide that I showed you, which is sort of the upworthy BuzzFeed um, version of uh, what Quartz has a accomplished. This is, we did not actually create this. This is, uh, from a site called Media Post. 
Um, but I think the, what you should have confidence in is that the, um, there is a strong, vibrant market, including for business news, when you're focused 100% on shareable, mobile, journalistic content. So I'm going to sit down. And uh, I think we have about 20 minutes for any questions that you might have. Thank you very much, Kevin. Um, I'd like to throw it open to um, questions from the floor. Um, if you could raise your hand and wait for the microphone to be passed to you. Um, and please identify yourselves and your affiliation um, to begin with. Um, let's start with uh, Philip at the back there. <clears throat> Philip Bowring, uh, freelance journalist. Uh, two questions. First of all, what was your startup capital? Second question, how do you deal with issues in unfree situations, for example, trying to report uh, uh, what's going on with the Thai monarchy today? Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's a relevant question, and Adam can follow up maybe. Adam is based in Bangkok for us, and, that, um, and we've done some reporting from there, and it is... Uh, challenging uh, to do that. Adam, do you want to do you want to take that part of the question? Sure. I mean, we operate under the same constraints as you know, any um, domestic or international any domestic or international uh, news organization in Thailand. In that, it's very difficult to write about the Thai monarchy and stay in the country and keep doing the job. So, I think similar to any other journalists who are there, we have to kind of work around the limits of the system. Uh, we do occasionally do things with our bylines and protecting the reporters and our sources, but I don't think we're breaking any new ground there. It's just playing under the same rules as everyone else. Yeah, I think our practices are consistent with every other journalist organization that's trying to uh, deal with those constraints. And your first question about our startup capital gets at the ownership. So Atlantic Media, which, own, which is a private company which owns the Atlantic magazine, um, is, has funded courts and... Um, and so we, we haven't disclosed any of the, the financing for it. Um, you know, what I can tell you is that relative to some VC-funded um, new startups, our capital is relatively modest and, uh, and our approach is relatively uh, conservative. What, what I didn't talk about is that um, our advertising sales side, which is the, the revenue side, of course, has been really successful at attracting advertisers. We've had about 85 advertisers, um, and they are advertisers that range from Goldman Sachs to Rolex, uh, who are looking to reach this business readership. And so um, it feels, we have confidence that there is actually a, a, a good business model with a return in a relatively short term for the owner of Atlantic Media. I'll just jump in there and, and, and ask how, how short term is relatively short term before you need to be paying your own bills. Um, so, so we have the good fortune to be owned by someone who is taking a long term view. So we don't feel any pressure in the short term. And what's a little bit challenging in terms of answering your question is that my guess is that if we wanted to, we could um, just about break even going into this coming year. Um, we've chosen not to do that. Quartz is only two years old, so we're really incredibly young. And so our strategy is that is to invest into this growth. And what that means really concretely is that we're hiring lots of journalists. We're hiring um, you know, selectively and strategically, but rather than try and um, try and reach profitability at a very accel accelerated basis, we're actually choosing to hire people. And so we've just added, we're adding, um, you know, in the month of December, we're adding a handful of new correspondents in London and San Francisco and New York. A question here? The... Yes. Hi. <clears throat> Edith Terry, uh, for, former journalist. Um, two questions. One, um, sort of following up on these uh, business questions, how do you monetize a Facebook share? Uh, and the second question is, since you have sort of an e economist model, which is a global content model, can you, but your resources are relatively thin uh, compared to the economist, how do you break, can you break stories? Have you broken stories? Yeah. So the Facebook share itself 
is not something that we monetize directly, but what we do monetize is the readers who come in via Facebook and other Twitter and LinkedIn and other social networks. And uh, we have non-standard advertising, including display ads that I would argue are more attractive and interactive than most of the ads that you see on your mobile phone. So it turns out that there is advertiser demand once a reader is in an article, including when they come in uh, via Facebook. Uh, once they're in an article, you know, we're monetizing them like, like everybody else is. Um, and then the second thing is how do you, how do you cover, how do you commit serious journalism, I think is your question, when you have a small staff. And the way that we've done that uh, is to, to focus our coverage on what we call obsessions. So when we were creating courts, we knew we identified exactly the issue that you just brought up, um, and and basically, um, you know, talked about it. I'm a big fan of magazines, and my observation was that as we were starting courts, was that the magazines that I liked most and the websites I liked most had defining obsessions. So th these are topics that they cared about. On the margins, they overcovered these topics, and as a reader, I understood what they thought was important. Quartz has done the same thing. And so our reporters, uh, instead of just covering real estate, tech, uh, business, politics, actually we, we require them to have a, a, a kind of a more focused view of what's important in the area they cover. So we have people who are traditional tech reporters, but they focus on specific aspects of, uh, of technology. If you go on the site, we, we initially thought we might not say tell readers explicitly that we had obsessions. Um, but if, but in the end decided we would actually just share that with our readers. So we have real journalists covering areas of obsession who are breaking news in these areas. Um, our focus is less on incremental news uh, breaking because that's a, that is a real um, kind of resource constraint in some ways. Um, but it is something that we do and, and something I'd love to do more of as our, as our staff grows. Thanks, Kevin. Um, question from the um, table, Tara. Hi, Kevin. I'm Tara Joseph with Reuters. Thanks a lot for that presentation, and I love the quartz curve, the quartz curve, so to speak. Um, you've obviously been at it for a few years, and you're, you're now into a formula that you think works. I'm just wondering if you could tell us about some of the challenges of being an online publication and what you feel you haven't quite figured out yet. That's a really interesting question. So. One thing we have not figured out yet is your area, which is video. And so um, we made a decision in, at the moment we were creating courts that video was very easy to do poorly, or at least in mediocre fashion. And it was very easy to lose money on video because it, if you're doing good video, it's very demanding of resources. So we're looking, uh, we're revisiting that and hope to get into video. That's one uh, thing. The second, um, you know, what are the other challenges that we have faced? Um, I think, I think part of the, part of doing this actually requires some amount of, um, of Zen approach to how your content finds its readers. And so, you know, over a period of two years, there are, there are sites and uh, social networks that are it fluctuates greatly, actually, the, the amount of readers that come in via some of these social networks. In aggregate, the growth has been great, but if you focus on a specific social network like LinkedIn and you fret about um, whether readers are coming in more or less from LinkedIn than they were six, month ago, six months ago, um, that's, really, uh, that's really challenging. And the last thing is to, uh, to continually push ourselves to uh, to be as agnostic about the format of our journalism. So early on, we, we uh, created a rule that uh, as editors, we would not edit any piece of content that was over 500 words unless the journalist had spoken with the, uh, an editor first. And it was because we're, a lot of us have traditional news backgrounds and we go on autopilot to 750 words. Um, and the, the point of that conversation and that rule was not that we didn't want things that were longer than 500 words, but we actually wanted a conscious decision. This either could be probably told a little more, more efficiently and conveyed to the reader more efficiently, 
or it was something that was, that was worth spending more time on and being more ambitious about because at the core it was an issue that was compelling and deserved 1,500 words and not 750. Um, question here, please. Hi, I'm Laurel West with The Economist Group. I'll ask you the same question I ask yeah. our own executives when they come out here. Why don't you have any data on your audience outside the U.S.? Um, so we do actually have data on our audience outside of the U.S. Um, and I want to say before I continue that, um, that Quartz, for the record, officially, formally, has great respect for The Economist. <laughs> <laughs> so please convey that back to you, your colleagues. Um, so, uh, so the, um, we do have data, it's, uh, the issue, the challenge, you know, which I think is what you're getting at is that some of the main sources that are used by advertisers to, to evaluate the digital audience, one of them is Comscore and it's, um, you know, I'm not sure, I'm not sure how much I should say, but Comscore itself has admitted that its methodology is is flawed for the last, the bulk of the last year, and they've had some problems which they've just acknowledged. And particularly outside of the U.S., that methodology is um, is challenging. So we do actually have some, um, we do have some data about our global readership. I mentioned that close to 90% of our readers in the U.K. are executives. I want the readership in the U.K. to be a lot bigger than it is, so it, that's one of the factors. Um, but there are some sources of data when you poke around to better understand uh, your readership. I can I can follow up with you afterwards if you if you want the names of some of them. Oh, in my presentation. Um, question at the end here, please. Thank you. Uh, my name is Eric Wisher. I'm from AFP News Agency. And this is not a job application, but I'm just interested in the... Your <laughs> job applications are fine, we are expanding. <laughs> I'm just interested in the profile of people who you hire. Yeah. Uh, and uh, what's the age range, you said it's... And also, uh, I mean, you talked about video. I mean, one way we, obviously, in our hiring policy, a lot of the young journalists we hire these days can multitask, including video. So would that not be a, a way into the video for you, but generally the age yeah. spread and the profile of people you hire. So the, the age, okay, so the age spread of our journalists is actually pretty broad, um, and in, in a way it's a, it's a bit of the quartz curve, you know, at work, and so I worked at the Wall Street Journal for 60, 16 years, Adam is a veteran of Reuters, um, and New York Magazine, where he was managing editor for their website, Bobby Ghosh, who some of you may know, who is with Time, uh, for 16 years was their international editor, Mitra Kalita, who is a, um, and so we have, we actually have a core, Heather Timmons, who's here in Hong Kong, who's worked at the New York Times for years. Um, we do actually have a core of us who are, you know, individually have 15, 20 years of journalistic experience. At the same time, um, we are working with younger people who, um, you know who were who were training as journalists. Effectively, that's part of that's part of the activity. Our um, everything that we do is edited. Uh, we have a bunch of editors who are actually working with the journalists, so we are able to work with younger journalists uh, and keep up the the quality. The thing that we're looking for in um, in hiring is journalistic experience, global. Uh, experience, experience of the world. You know, generally our preference is people who speak two languages or more. Um, there, some familiarity with digital and social, and what that means is a is a good um, thing to bring to the job. But at the very least, a, a, an enthusiasm for uh, the the world that we're we're trying to write for, and the tools that we're using. We're all we're rolling up our sleeves, and we're all cropping our own photos and making our own charts and writing our own headlines, which, which is fun and, and liberating, but, but requires an appetite for that. Um, I'm going to try and squeeze at least one more question in. Uh, here, please. Hang Xiao from Forbes. Um, in terms of the curve you mentioned, um, in terms of articles that are not popular on your site, besides the lens itself, are there other characteristics they share in common? Yeah. And also, in terms of obsession that you mentioned, um, 
it, are, are you suggesting that most of the stories on course are reactionary in the sense that you're writing about topics that, that are already trendy and how do you determine what, what kind of tools and how do you determine what are the obsessions? Yeah, so your first question is about the quartz curve. Um, and so there are a few attributes I mentioned. So the length is the one that I, that I went into. Um, there's also depth, which is related often. You could argue that, that the map of every satellite is not long, but it's deep. Um, and the other thing that is a, is a factor in the curve is, is the time from the um, moment at which a news event occurs. So it's easier to be successful with something right at the moment that something occurs, or if you give yourself some time to, um, to do a deeper analysis or, or bring a deeper context to it and let some time pass, you actually can go back to the same topic. So those are some of the, um, those are some of the dynamics. And your second question was uh, about the obsessions. So the obsessions are responsible. They guide a percentage of our coverage. So it's not all of our coverage. And we are uh, writing about um, things that we didn't anticipate when we last uh, revisited our obsessions. Um, so, so I don't think, essentially what we're doing is we're requiring reporters to, to understand the macro context of what they're covering and to, um, and effectively what obsessions are is the future. It's a, it's a bit of a guess about the future of, of the area in which they're covering. But we also write um, plenty of articles uh, you know, based on the news or what's really most important for business readers in a given day. Do we, we do, in fact, have time for one very last question, if anyone from the floor just... If we could keep it brief, please. Thank you. Let's squeeze it in. Okay, I will try and keep this brief. <clears throat> um, I work at the Hong Kong Stock Exchange, uh, but also run a, 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 just a sort of a hobby news website as well. Um, and I'm interested in looking at sites like Box and Quartz and, and BuzzFeed. Um, I know they have sort of an internal creative team as well that helps with sponsored content mm -hmm. and advertising and that sort of thing. So you mentioned you've got banner ads or display ads on your site, but are you involved in other kinds of advertising? And what, what, what are the sorts of ways that you're sort of building a, a business? Yeah. So they're basically, we have essentially four revenue, um, four types of advertising. One is, which we didn't talk about at all, is events. And so we actually have a bunch of events that we put on. The Atlantic, which is our sister news organization, has been extremely successful and co-founded the Aspen Ideas Festival and other great events. So that's one thing. We put that aside. There's our morning email, which goes to about 100,000 people. Um, and there is sponsorship there. And then there are two other types of advertising on courts. One is uh, display ads, uh, which are non-custom ads. They often have video in them um, and are you know, large and more like a, a full page ad in a magazine than the traditional banner or little box you see on a website. The second thing, which I think gets at your question, and, and it's worth saying that we have about three uh, engineers and a team of uh, marketers who help uh, brands build those display advertiser, uh, advertisements. And then on top of that, we have native advertising. So we have posts that are created by sponsors that use a lot of the same tools of, as our journalists. Those are created by teams that are 100% separate from our journalists uh, and involve marketing folks and developers. So the, we probably have about, you know, in the range of seven or eight people who are employed on the sales and marketing side who work on the creation of the advertisements for, for courts. Um, it's important to say that the, the native advertising, we take great pains to make sure it's really labeled. And none of the journalists actually sees the advertising until it goes on the site. We have zero involvement with the production of that, which is an issue some people like to talk about, or ask about at least. Thank you very much, Kevin. Well, I need to wrap it up there, but thank it's been a uh, really stimulating, interesting overview of... Uh, Great. Where, well, where thank, thank you all for your questions and your time. Thank you. Appreciate you. Thank you. Thanks very much.